we'll let our Zoom people bring us all back together. Um, we have fallen slightly behind schedule. We will go until 12.50 with this panel and then break for lunch until 1.30, uh, which I understand you are available then to come back and we'll deal with Q&A at that point when we get back, as well as public comment on the two panels all at the same time. Is that acceptable to commissioners? Very good. And I'll turn the floor over to our next panel. Thank you. Um, our slides should be coming up in a moment. Um, I'm Carl Shapiro. I'm the chair of this working group. This is the single firm conduct working group. Um, we're going to have a bit of a shift in tone here, I'd say, in that our report and our presentation doesn't have data and charts, and it's not going to be as fun to look at. It's more about legal doctrine and the cases. And we have in our report proposed or example statutory language regarding single firm conduct. So the scope of our report is broad in the sense that it covers all industries, um, but we're not gonna be getting into specific industries, although we will give case examples. Um, the, let me say a little bit about the group. Uh, names are listed here that are on the report. Each person will introduce themselves when they speak and each of our group members will speak. Doug Melamed and Fiona Scott Morton are remote. Aaron Edlin, Doug, uh, excuse me, Sam Miller and, and uh, I are here. Um, we are, I feel very fortunate that we have such a really good group to do this report. We've worked on it about a year. Uh, we figured out between the five of us, we have 100 years of experience you know, doing uh, antitrust uh, practitioner work and government enforcement and 100 years experience doing antitrust economics and a bunch of teaching in there. And so uh, when you're hearing from a group that really we have a lot of experience, both as academics writing and thinking about these issues, but also as practitioners. Okay, so uh, we view ourselves as very grounded in that sense. And we hope our report and our presentation will uh, make that self-evident. Um, the, uh, my, this again, each of us can introduce myself. I'm Carl Shapiro. I'm an emeritus professor at UC Berkeley. I served twice as the chief, chief economist in the antitrust division. I've testified quite a few times as an economic expert witness in antitrust cases for the government, typically the uh, DOJ or the FTC, federal cases. Um, and I have extensive writings in this area that we will skip over. <laughs> um, I also, uh, if, if, is a disclosure, if you go to my website at UC Berkeley, there's disclosure about companies I work for and financial, you know, the typical disclosures are there. I would also say for everybody, we, um, we welcome questions. Um, maybe you'll do it at, after lunch, the way we're doing the timing, but if you want to interrupt, that's fine too. Okay, all right. So um, I said, we worked for about a year on the report. We, um, the document that we produced, I would say is a, it's a group document. So it's a committee document in that sense. We all agree on the general thrust and the key themes. We don't necessarily everyone agree with every sentence that we would have written it just that way, but we, we are really in concert in terms of the overall message. And that notwithstanding, or despite the fact that we come from rather different perspectives. So we took a bunch of work to get to this point and, and we're happy with our product. So we wanna focus on today, uh, the report is fairly short actually in some sense, I think it's about 20 pages, but we're really gonna to focus today on the statutory language we put forward there, which we'll call it, I think of it as a, a sample statutory language. And this is not the Sherman Act, but nor is it the New York Act that you mentioned, for example. This is new language that is, we're proud of, I would think I would say in the sense that we've thought very hard and this is uh, about how do we think a 21st century antitrust act for California would look like recognizing the history and the background? And that's, that's what we're gonna mostly present today, how we got there and how it's supposed to work, how we think it would work well, okay? Um, and so not only the language, but then the motivation and reasoning behind it. Okay, uh, next slide, please. 
So um, single firm conduct, uh, next slide at some point. So first, what is single firm conduct? What is the scope of what this report is about as opposed to others? There are the seven working groups. Um, so single firm conduct refers to the behavior of firms, and we're thinking of large, powerful firms, that they're doing, as the language suggests, on their own, by themselves, not through a collusive agreement, for example. Okay, so you know a lot of cartel cases. Those are those are not going to be single firm contact. Those are uh, competitors agreeing to do something to restrict competition. Single firm contact is the focus is on a, on a single powerful firm, typically trying to defend their position from competitive threats, and we're worried about them doing it in a nefarious or unproductive, socially unproductive way, or a way that harms competition. So let's give two. Let me give two examples. Um, something called purely unilateral conduct. So a, a firm simply says, I don't want to deal with these other, let's say a competitor or a counterparty. A good example from federal law is the Aspen ski case, where uh, there were two ski, ski companies in Aspen, and they, for years, they had a joint pass. So you could buy a pass and ski in both, on both, both mountains. And then the larger one, let's call it dominant, they decided, no, we're not gonna offer this joint pass anymore. And the evidence shown at trial that was in order to hope to get rid of or drive the other smaller firm out of business because people wouldn't wanna buy a ticket just for the smaller mountain. And that went up the Supreme Court and that um, selective refusal to deal after with the competitor after engaging in a course of dealing for many years was found to be illegal, okay? Later, the Supreme Court said that was at the outer edges of the Sherman Act, but uh, that was illegal. So this was a discriminatory treatment of rivals, not dealing with them, okay? Um, now that's, we, we, one needs to be careful though about imposing any duties to deal on companies to deal with their competitors or counterparties. That could be quite intrusive. And once you start impose that, well, what are the terms and conditions of dealing? So. So one has to be very careful there, but that would be an example of unilateral conduct. Okay, that big ski company made that decision on their own not to deal with a competitor. Now we have a quote here, just to indicate the dangers in our report, it's not on the screen, uh, from the Alcoa case that says, this is Justice Judge Leonard Hand, a single producer may be the survivor out of a group of active competitors merely by virtue of his superior skill, foresight and industry and goes on to say, in such cases, a strong argument can be made that the act, the Sherman Act, does not condemn, uh, even though this may, may result, the, excuse me, expose the public to the evils of monopoly, essentially, that's not illegal. Okay, it's not necessarily illegal. And this goes to, to your point, I think, uh, Commissioner Simpson, which is companies that get to be large or powerful through foresight, you know, competition on the merits, we don't want to start imposing on duties on them and so forth. So you can see already refusal to deal, there's going to be nuances. There may be some relatively rare cases where certain types may be, may be condemned, but often not. The other category of single firm conduct, agreements with others, exclusive dealing. So let me give another example, a, a DOJ case against uh, Dent Supply, which was a monopoly dominant manufacturer of artificial teeth, no less. This is about 25 years ago. Exclusive dealing, their arrangement, their manufacturer, these teeth were, artificial teeth were distributed through a bunch of specialty distributors who then sold them, I guess, to dentists and whatnot. They had an, they had an arrangement, if you want to, I'll be dense by, if you want to sell my teeth, you can't sell any other competing teeth. Exclusive dealing, you have to deal exclusively with me. Well, that's obviously gonna make it very hard for these smaller competitors who are selling this artificial teeth to get distribution. So that, I think, on its face could be uh, a way to fortify the monopoly position, exclude competitors, and weaken the competitive process. The DOJ went after that case, and they won that one. So that's a, a category of single firm conduct that, uh, that's the sort of thing we're talking about. And there are, there are quite a few more areas of conduct, but those are two examples. So we've now defined the, the category single firm conduct, at least in sketch. The goal, as shown in the slide, is to prohibit single firm conduct that harms competition, okay? Not single firm conduct that we welcome, such as innovating, 
making better products, typically lower prices. So this distinction between the good and the bad conduct, that's what's hard. And it gets that that's what we worked on hard and that the Sherman Act is, has been evolved in that direction. That's where the magic happens here, trying to figure out how the courts can do it. Can the legislature guide the courts to have good effective rules for controlling anti-competitive single firm conduct without getting in the way of what we want firms to be doing by competing vigorously. Okay, uh, point here, competition delivers many benefits to California. I think you've heard from the previous panel about that. Diana Moss made a nice bit on that. We won't say more on that. Okay, and then federal law, just still setting things up. The part of the federal law that deals with single firm conduct is the Sherman Act, section two. It, it outlaws monopolization and attempted monopolization. Um, and we'll be talking a lot about Sherman Act section two and how it compares with what we're doing or what we're proposing. And then California law, this is, a, I think you probably are aware, this is a, a known gap in the Cartwright Act that it does not reach purely unilateral conduct. So that's, our, that's, that's what we're covering, that's our challenge. So the roadmap is like, well, maybe we should just adopt the Sherman Act. There's a federal law, would that be good? We have a gap in the Cartwright Act and we're gonna end up saying, no, we don't think just replicating the Sherman Act is a good idea. We have an alternative thoughts or proposal uh, that's where we're going. Okay, next slide. Okay, so like I said, why not copy the Sherman Act? So for starters, if you read the act, maybe you have, it's rather remarkable, we broad and vague. It says, in short, it's illegal to monopolize or attempt to, let's focus on monopolize. I won't keep saying attempt, right? Well, okay, well, what's that mean? Okay. And first off, there's an important idea. It's not illegal to have a monopoly, okay? Hence, the firm that may have achieved a dominant position just by having better products and innovating, clearly okay. But what is this monopolization? What sort of conduct, you know, is going to count? And so the act says nothing. It's 1890. So it's all been developed through case law, common law, as you've heard and, and you may know. So... Just for starters, wait a moment, why would you replicate an act from 135 years ago that's so vague, right? And you might say, well, the case law is just great. It's really fleshed this all out. Common law is a great process. We just wanna import all that into California. Well, our view is not so much. We don't think the case law has developed so well. Uh, there are some commentators who say it's fine. So that's, that's something I think you wanna address. You know, we think we could do much better. And how and why? Well, economic learning has advanced a lot since 1890. The case law has evolved. Um, and we can build on these as the, the legislature can build on these to, to do better. We also put here widespread view that the federal courts have overly narrowed the Sherman Act. And this creates an opportunity to improve on federal law. So uh, there's a lot of literature out there. We, out there, we did not want to send you a 150-page report that reviewed all the literature and you know, and it's, it like went through the cases. You wouldn't read it. We didn't want to do the work. It's not necessary. It's out there, and so we can work with staff more if necessary to identify that. We've many of us have written some of those articles ourselves. Okay, so we just we didn't want to copy all that here. I think a predicate for where we're going is accepting that proposition that the Sherman Act is not working that well, it's been overly narrowed by the federal courts, particularly the Supreme Court. Okay, if you know, and that's in judgment, we're, we're not so much making that case here. We think it's in the literature, we think it's well supported, um, but it's a predicate for what we're doing. Okay, I should say also the evidence that you're gonna find is not empirical studies with data. That's not the way this area of law and policy works. You really involves looking at the cases and seeing how has the court decided, did it lead to good results? Was the, was the economic sound? And we'd say in, in a number of cases, not. And we think we could do better. Okay, so we can do better with the 21st century statute. And, and we're offering you something on that. Um, so I should say though that um, we are not trying to this is not some academic exercise. Oh, we just had these great ideas. We're weaving together what we've learned from decades, or a century of case law. 
what the economics and actually business strategy literature tells us too. So, so that is that is going into the mix here. And as it says here, faithful to the fundamental antitrust principles, which have longstanding bipartisan support. So that's what's going to come out in the rest of this presentation. How what we're talking about is not a change in the goals, namely to protect and promote competition, to prevent anti-competitive exclusionary conduct. That's the goals. The question is how to give guidance so it works better. And so the courts can do it with guidance from the California legislature. And the one reason it's complicated is because there's so many different fact patterns that arise in different settings. I'm gonna quote from the Microsoft case here, one of the important federal cases that, uh, that where the government won, the DC circuit, the means of illicit exclusion, like the means of legitimate competition, are myriad. And so because the world is complicated, many different strategies, markets are different, hospital markets are different from, you know, grocery store markets are different from, you know, media, you know, streaming markets, they're just very different. We need to give more guidance, but faithful to these principles about the goal to prevent anti-competitive exclusionary conduct by powerful firms. Okay, so that's what the goal is. I think we're ready to move on now to, um, I feel like I'm ready to hand it over. So we go to the next slide. And this is Fiona Scott Morton, who hopefully will pop up here. Um, she's running a conference today, so she can't be here, but um, she's uh, hopefully on Zoom. Can everybody hear me and see me? Yes. Great. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation to participate. Um, I'm an economics professor at the Yale School of Management, where I specialize in competition economics. I've written many academic articles in the economics profession in, in those journals and in law, as well as making contributions to competition policy. I direct the Thurman Arnold Project at Yale, which helps Yale law students write about competition law topics, participate in enforcement through a legal clinic, assist with competition policy research, and so forth. In addition, like Carl, I have government enforcement experience as a chief economist at the DOJ Antitrust Division under President Obama, as well as having done consulting for both federal agencies and a number of private uh, plaintiffs. Before we get into the details of the statute that we describe in our report, um, let me describe some of the conduct that Carl mentioned at a high level. And this conduct, in our view, um, and in the, the literature that Carl mentioned is, is, has been recognized as is going unchecked uh, under current federal law. And I'm gonna put these into a few categories, but um, as the Microsoft court said, there's a almost endless list of them, but here, uh -huh. here are some of the uh, popular and common uh, categories. So one is called exclusive dealing. These provisions block counterparties from doing business with the powerful powerful firm's rivals because they have to be the the counterparties have to be exclusive with the powerful firm. The business offered by the powerful firm essentially coerces the counterparties into being exclusive, and that prevents rivals from attracting business due to the merits of their products. And the issue with these contracts is that many are completely harmless. An office building in a city that wants an exclusive contract with a coffee shop is not going to harm competition in either office buildings or coffee shops. And indeed, such a contract might be desirable for a small entrepreneur as a way to grow. By contrast, if the exclusive contract covers the only channel by which suppliers can access end consumers like false teeth, then the channel can use those exclusive uh, contracts to pick winners and stifle competition on one side or the other. Because an exclusive contract among firms with no market power is harmless, while other exclusive contracts can be very harmful, a law does really wouldn't be a good idea to allow all exclusives that would create market power or ban all exclusives that would stop very sensible things from happening. Huge harm would, would occur under either of those scenarios and that's why we use the rule of reason. Loyalty rebates are contract terms that a powerful firm imposes on customers that penalize a customer who conducts more business with the powerful firm's rivals. So the rivals become unable to compete on the merits of their product because when they try to sell to a customer, that customer has a big penalty that they owe to the powerful firm. And under current federal law, this behavior is often analyzed using some kind of cost test that doesn't ac accurately capture the penalty to the customer. 
And that causes the courts to miss the harm and let through the anti-competitive conduct. Most favored nation clauses prevent counterparties from trading on more favorable terms with rivals to the powerful firm. And if that rival, for example, has a lower cost or a different business model, that lower price might be very reasonable and indeed reflect uh, the conditions of the relationship. And when that lower price or different conditions are prevented by the powerful firm, uh, it stops the lower price being passed through the end consumers, benefiting both those end consumers and this inexpensive supplier. The powerful firm withholds its purchases from, for example, a supplier, unless the supplier raises its price to the rival efficient distribution channel. And that prevents the rival from doing business because it no longer has a competitive advantage and blocks that low cost entrant. Under current federal law, the harm from this conduct is often just missed entirely because the court sees only that the powerful firm demands symmetry or equal treatment and it feels that's fair, rather than realizing that symmetry blocks uh, um, a desirable business model or a more efficient uh, competitor. Both loyalty rebates and MFNs can help entrants and consumers in a few instances. For example, when there's uncertainty and investments need to be made, a product may not even come to market unless participants can be guaranteed the same terms as others. So again, we use, tend to use the rule of reason for this. Discrimination against rivals occurs when a powerful firm refuses to reply, provide rivals access to a platform or product or service that it provides to other less threatening third parties. The powerful firm may recognize that certain third parties may grow into rivals or may lower the powerful firm's switching cost, and that would stimulate entry and the entry of rivals would then lower the powerful firm's profits. Courts have been very hesitant to look ahead to accept uncertainty and risk that arise in real business situations and, and use the law to protect nascent and potential entrants and entry. They have not been sufficiently sensitive to the power of a firm that is not already a monopolist, doesn't have every single transaction of this type, but it has enough market power that it is affecting entry, innovation, and investment by rivals who want to keep compete directly with that powerful firm or compete in an adjacent product or service that will threaten the powerful firm. But of course, banning all discrimination with a bright line rule would not permit non-powerful firms from adjusting their terms of trade to reflect differences in demand and costs and so on. So again, uh, we need the rule of reason. Agreements to limit competition occur when a powerful firm uses some other context like a patent settlement or a supply agreement to offer valuable consideration to a potential entrant in exchange for that entrant staying out or limiting its ability to compete. Pay for delay patent settlements are a well-known example of this kind of conduct. Courts have trouble recognizing when these contracts contain restrictions on competition and have not sufficiently protected competition. The case of pay for delay is sufficiently egregious that the state of California has even attempted to ban it directly. Killer acquisitions are another example of a contract and acquisition that can be utilized to increase market power. These clearly must be analyzed under a rule of reason because not every acquisition is this harmful kind. Uh, lastly, predatory pricing occurs when a powerful firm attempts to drive a rival out of the market or into a, a, a narrow niche and then raise price or make trading terms unfavorable after competition has been lessened. The federal courts have all but made this conduct impossible to prosecute under the antitrust laws. Um, again, we wouldn't want a rule banning low prices. That's obviously not a good idea. Uh, we need to analyze this through the lens of the lessening of competition. So these examples are just a sampling of the tactics that powerful firms use to hang on to their market power or increase it. They are very common, unfortunately, in the economy. Um, I mean, the unfortunate, they're very common across in many firms that don't have market power. Unfortunately, they're also common among firms that do have market power um, because it's of course really profitable to hang on to your market power or even increase your market power. And this is why we need effective antitrust laws. And as you've seen from this short list, there are many of these most prominent forms of anti-competitive conduct are not being adequately disciplined by the federal antitrust laws as they're interpreted by courts today. And I think it's very important for California to start fresh and try to do this better. 
Um, I hope the examples give you an understanding that many of these behaviors are harmless when they're used by firms with no market power, but can be very damaging to competition when they're deployed by powerful firms. Um, I'll just close by noting that, as Carl said, I'm, I'm running a conference in New York today, and I had been uh, carefully following the schedule that you put out, um, which had me speaking uh, somewhat earlier and questions somewhat earlier. So I'm um, not optimistic that I can come back uh, for the question time, but I'd be happy to uh, take questions by email or, or another time. Um, next up, uh, now I hope that you've discovered how terrible uh, the situation is. You're going to want to know what the solution is. And we indeed worked on some language that might be useful. And I'm going to turn it over to Doug Melamed, who's going to explain how our language will help courts distinguish between these harmless uses of, of these tactics and very dangerous uses of these tactics. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Fiona. Um, uh, and thank you to the commission. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak uh, to you about this really important subject. Now, let me first apologize. I'm getting over a cold, so I may uh, sound a little hoarse or interrupt my talking by, by coughing. Uh, let me tell you first a little about who I am. I spent the last 10 years... Hey, Doug, Doug just yeah. one second. I just want to do a point of process. I apologize. We have three more presentations. I just wanted to make sure how you wanted to handle it. We could break now or after the presentations are done, but that'll take at least a half hour more. I just want to know what you want to do in terms of lunch because we are running later. We started this, we said we'd proceed until one, then break for a half hour. Okay, or 12.50, but we, we will not be done with our presentations. I just want you to understand that, that we'll have some after lunch then. Okay, shall I be in? Yeah. Um, Hold on, Doug. Yeah, well then let's, let's break now. When we come back with everybody fresh, we can move at a, um, a nice clip. That'll be a change. Uh, One fifteen. We'll be back at our chairs. Thank you, Doug. Sorry about that. We'll we'll um. Okay. We'll start right after lunch. One fifteen. Very much. Um, we're going to start with Doug Melamud, who is remote. Ready to go? Okay, everybody. Um, uh, again, thank you for letting me speak to the commission about this matter. Uh, let me first tell you a little bit about who I am. I spent the last 10 years on the faculty at Stanford Law School where among other things, I taught and wrote about antitrust law. For more than 40 years before then, I practiced law. Most of that time was in a law firm in Washington, DC. But I also spent about four and a half years in the antitrust division of the US Justice Department, first as the principal deputy to the head of the division, and for the last several months of the Clinton administration as acting assistant attorney general in charge of the antitrust division. And from 2009 until 2014, I was senior vice president and general counsel of Intel Corporation. So I think it's safe to say that I've seen antitrust issues both as a government enforcer and as a corporate defendant. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the provision from our report that is copied on the slide that is on the screen now. 
So this paragraph suggests specific language that might be included in new California legislation that sets forth what we understand to be the key normative and economic principles underlying sound antitrust law. The principles described in this paragraph are not new. Instead, the paragraph makes explicit the fundamental purpose of the antitrust laws, it is reflected in the cases taken as a whole since those laws were enacted. It clarifies the key principles to ensure that they can be broadly understood. Making these principles and objectives explicit should remove doubt about them. As things currently stand, these ideas are expressed <clears throat> with different words by courts and commentators, and those variations both give litigants opportunities to make, shall we say, creative arguments and often create uncertainty among judges and lawyers. As I'm sure was apparent from Professor Scott Morton's presentation, no one paragraph can spell out all the details for applying the antitrust laws to the multitude of factual circumstances and behaviors to which they apply. But by making the fundamental principles explicit, this paragraph provides a standard to guide the more specific implementing decisions that courts are called upon to make. It is the implementing decisions adopted by the federal courts that, in the committee's view, need correction because some of them, not all, of course, but some of them have failed effectively and properly to implement the fundamental principles summarized in the slide. But before we turn to those implementing provisions, I want to take a few minutes to spell out what this paragraph means. Let's start, not surprisingly, with paragraph one. Harm to competition is, quote, diminishing the competitive constraints imposed by defendants' rivals. The paragraph thus, thus makes clear that harming competition means weakening rivals. If I own a gas station and the gas station across the street from me charges $3 a gallon, I'm not going to be able to charge $4 a gallon. The customers will look at the marquees with the prices and go to the station across the street. But if that gas station across the street goes out of business, or its costs increase so, uh, so that it, 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 uh, it cannot charge less than $4 a gallon, then I'm not going to be so constrained that I'll be free to charge $4. In that case, we would say competition has been harmed. But we don't want to trivialize the idea of harm to competition. If a single taxi driver in a big city gets in an accident and her car is out of commission, that's not likely to enable other taxis to raise their prices. The law should prohibit only conduct that matters. And what matters is conduct that increases what antitrust lawyers and economists call the defendant's market power, which is, of course, a phrase taken from the paragraph. Market power is a well-understood term. It means, by definition, the ability of a firm to profit by raising price or lowering quality or otherwise acting in a way that harms its customers. So antitrust law is concerned with conduct that weakens competition by weakening rivals, enough to enable firms to profit by actions that harm its customers. This paragraph spells that out and removes, I think, any doubt about it. Now, point two in the paragraph is, is also very important. We would not want to make it illegal for a firm to embed a much better product and as a result, largely free itself from constraints by inferior competitors. That would be a recipe for halting economic progress. So the law says that conduct is okay if it provides benefits that are substantial enough to prevent the customers from being harmed by any reduction in competitive constraints. So if I build a much better product, and even though I drive inferior rivals out of business or marginalize them, if my customers are better off, that's okay. These basic principles that antitrust is about weakening the constraint of rivals and thereby increasing market power, and that conduct is okay if it provides benefits sufficient to outweigh the harm, are fundamental to antitrust law. But they're not spelled out in the existing statutes, and they must be inferred from hundreds of antitrust cases. California has an opportunity, by this language, to make these principles explicit and to make the law far more clear than it is at present. Two more things I think should be noted about this paragraph. <clears throat> As you can see, part one of the paragraph refers to conduct that diminishes or creates a risk of diminishing competitive constraints or, and that uh, increases or creates a risk 
uh, the increasing market power. This is a, this captures, I think, a very important and often overlooked idea. Antitrust law prohibits both conduct that has already harmed competition and led to higher prices or inferior products, and competition that will harm competition, uh, competi uh, rather, and conduct that will harm competition if it continues in the future. For example, the Justice Department's case of, against Microsoft, in which I was uh, deeply involved in the Clinton administration, was a case about future harm. Microsoft was engaging in conduct that did not benefit computer users, but reduced the likelihood that other firms would be able to compete against it in the future. All eight federal judges who were involved in the case, a majority of them conservative Republicans, agreed that that was sufficient for an antitrust violation. There should be nothing really controversial about the idea that conduct that threatens harm in the future might violate the antitrust laws, but some people continue to argue, mistakenly in my view, that an antitrust violation requires proof of higher prices or some other harm in the past. The language about risk of harm in part one of the paragraph on the slide is intended to make clear that an antitrust violation can be based solely on conduct that threatens harm in the future. Second, the slide refers to trading partners, not customers or consumers. Now that's not some kind of pedantic academic term. It's an important substantive provision. The antitrust laws are about harm to competition, whether it's competition among sellers or competition among buyers, and whether the person on the other side of the deal is a customer or a supplier. For example, when I was in the Justice Department, we challenged a merger that we thought would substantially lessen competition in grain purchasing from farmers and other suppliers in various areas in the United States. The merger would have led to lower prices paid to those farmers. That's why we challenged it. In the more recent so-called no poach cases, the Justice Department challenged agreements among a number of tech firms, and I have to admit Intel was one of them, that reduced competition among them for employees and were thought to suppress wages. There was and is no serious dispute that the antitrust laws apply to the kinds of harm to competition among buyers and employers that were at issue in those cases. The antitrust laws have long been understood to protect farmers, workers, small businesses, and other sellers, as well as buyers. This language is intended to make that clear. So we are suggesting that California make explicit these fundamental antitrust principles to remove doubt and to guide the implementation of the antitrust laws in the future. We hope that adopting these explicit statements of fundamental principles will help California courts avoid some of the mistakes that we think federal courts have made implementing these provisions and these principles in the past. For that, I'm gonna to turn to Professor Adlin, but before I do, I wanna make sure, I'm, I'm glad to take any questions that members of the commission might have about this paragraph before we turn it over to Professor Edwin. Hearing none, I'm going to say, Aaron, it's all yours. both in antitrust economics and antitrust law. So I'm a professor of both economics and law, and I'm the uh, switch hitter on our working group that made the 100 years of experience on both sides possible. Uh, I'm co-author of a leading case book on antitrust, as well as lots of articles. Um, and I have White House experience covering antitrust. Uh, Doug and I was there when Doug and other people came to tell us the, they were launching the Microsoft case. Um, I'm also an entrepreneur who spent 20 years starting, growing a successful business that we ultimately sold. But what I'm here today to talk about is to elaborate on what Doug said and uh, to explain if you'd be willing to move to the next slide. Uh, the improvements of that statutory language uh, over the Sherman Act. <clears throat> the first, which you may have 
is that it is a clearer standard for antitrust liability. Uh, as Carl Shapiro said, monopolizing is, which is what Sherman Act Section 2 bans, is completely unclear. Uh, remarkably, it's unclear even after 120 or 130 years of jurisprudence, as I'll explain a little bit about. Um, the courts have adopted all kinds of standards and rules uh, for when an acts are anti-competitive, and firms don't know which one's going to apply. And the standards and rules tend to be proxies for anti-competitive conduct rather than really getting at the heart of it. So the focus of those uh, two paragraphs that Doug so well explained is directly on the harm to competition that we see coming out of the 130 years of antitrust experience we have in the United States. Um, and the, so what, what's at the heart, as Doug said, is diminishing uh, the competitive constraint that rivals pose and getting market power from that. So the right way to get ahead of rivals is to improve your products or your efficiency of production. That's what we'd like to see in our economy. We'd like to see that from big firms. We'd like to see that from small firms. And improving your product or the efficiency of your production typically does not entail diminishing uh, the competitive constraints of rivals. And so it doesn't get you in trouble with this act. Uh, some, some of the commenters I think didn't uh, dig deep into the meaning of this language uh, to discover that. And so they feared it would. You, you can think of competition as a foot race. And the right way to win the race is to run really fast. That's pretty clear. Uh, it's not to slow down your rivals by putting quicksand or marbles in their lane. Uh, so for example, if you consider an example from the healthcare markets that you heard about earlier today, uh, you might have a dental insurance company that becomes powerful by putting together a broad network of dentists and offering employers dental insurance and access to this network at low prices. Well, that's absolutely wonderful. Nothing bad can be said of that. However, suppose this insurance company uses clever contracting, as many have, to block rivals uh, who would otherwise enter at low prices by making it uneconomical for dentists who have excess supply and would be happy to sell the entrant uh, some services at low prices at a discount. Well, when you've done that, uh, you have a live antitrust and competition problem as we see it. And uh, you've then uh, satisfied that first prong uh, that Doug Melamed explained. Now, in tough cases, a, a powerful firm uh, may have some defenses to that. And they may argue that okay, we've diminished our, the competitive constraint our rivals offer, but we'd like to defend ourselves by pointing out that we've created some benefits. Uh, suppose if you take the Microsoft uh, example that uh, Carl drew us to from the 1990s, Microsoft redesigns its operating system and it does so in such a way that it makes it incompatible with rival uh, browsers like Netscape. Now, that is potentially anti-competitive. And uh, as almost everyone used Windows at the time, uh, that kind of thing would make it difficult for a rival like Netscape to compete with Internet Explorer. Now, on the other hand, perhaps Microsoft could show that its operating system uh, made its browser, Internet Explorer, uh, much more effective and that these changes were critical to that. Well, that might be a viable expense, uh, defense for Microsoft. And that's what paragraph two 
is about. Um, but the prong, paragraph two, subtly says some important things. Uh, the first is that Microsoft can't keep all those benefits. They can't say, well, we've done a bunch of harm to competition, but we made ourselves rich in the process and that, and that uh, should justify it. Also, the benefits can't be trivial. They're going to have to be substantial enough that these trading partners and passed on to these trading partners so that the trading partners are actually better off. Uh, believe it or not, that's, it's, it's not clear that uh, in the section two case law, uh, neither of those two things are clear though we think they're very clear principles. So I mentioned the, the next thing I wanted to address are proxies. So the existing jurisprudence uses a whole host of proxies for anti-competitive conduct rather than going straight and saying, let's look and see if there is anti-competitive conduct and defining what that term means. And as they use proxies, uh, this naturally leads to errors. The proxies are neither necessary nor sufficient. And very frequently, uh, they've served to make it very difficult uh, for plaintiffs to win cases, even when they have what uh, all five of us would consider to be good cases. And we come from very, very different uh, perspectives in our plaintiff and defendant friendliness. Uh, section uh, F8 of the language we have is a whole long list of proxies. Uh, but one proxy is being a monopoly. So uh, a firm with monopoly power will frequently have the capacity to harm rivals in anti-competitive ways and diminish the competitive constraints it faces. But firms without monopoly power and who aren't plausibly monopolies can frequently do that too. So uh, cases in, where uh, a dental insurer, for example, had 30% of the market share have been able to exclude rivals uh, in the kind of example I was giving above. Uh, another example is the equally efficient competitor test where a court might say that uh, your behavior is illegal if and only if it could exclude an equally efficient competitor or possibly if it has excluded an equally efficient competitor and the plaintiff is in fact or more efficient. And it, it turns out that that is uh, over-inclusive of un under-inclusive of anti-competitive behavior uh, because uh, less efficient competitors can often provide uh, customers with a lot of value that a powerful firm is not. And the only way to make a powerful uh, firm provide that kind of value is if they at the very least have to compete on fair terms on an even playing field with that less efficient competitor um, rather than employing some clever contractual advice like the dental insurer did above. Uh, another proxy is below cost pricing, uh, the below cost pricing test for predatory pricing. Uh, firms can as uh, I've written about and one of the future commenters, Tom Campbell has written about, can uh, uh, price above cost while doing, engaging in anti-competitive predatory pricing. Um, the, next, the next bullet I wanna highlight is that this legislation fills a very important, two very important gaps in the Sherman Act. Uh, one, which I alluded to, has to do with monopolies. So section one of the Sherman Act bans agreements among many firms in restraint of trade. Section two bans monopolizing. So to, since single firms can uh, do anti-competitive things without being a monopoly, there's a big gap that the Sherman Act has left. And many people have recognized that over time. And uh, by not hinging on monopolies or not hinging on being a dominant firm, uh, this language gets rid of that problem. 
another gap, which I was alluding to above, is this. What happens if your exclusionary conduct comes with benefits? Well, existing law, as I said, isn't actually clear whether the benefits must exceed the harm or whether any legitimate business uh, justification can get a defendant off. Uh, the, last, the last thing I'll say uh, is the last bullet, which uh, probably, uh, probably is superfluous given what you've heard, but some of the commentators miss this, which is uh, actions are not illegal if trading partners benefit. And uh, simply uh, making great products and innovating is not going to get you in any kind of trouble uh, with this act. So now I'd like to turn, turn the mic over to Sam Miller. So do you have a question? Yeah, just, just, just a quick question, just to, to clarify. Um, uh, in some of the prior um, materials we've had, we've heard about the rule of reason. Is this effectively the rule of reason? I mean, uh, writ large, I guess. It's probably what the rule of reason should be, okay. but the rule of reason could be any number of things in yeah. different courts at different times. Uh, so, but effectively there has to be some offsetting benefit to the, um, Direct, yes. So the, the direct impact on, on rivals versus the offsetting benefit to some other parties, the trading partners, maybe consumers, or I don't know what. But that, that's right. The so the rule of reason is <clears throat> it anticipates some balancing like that. It's yeah. not an, hurting rivals is not in itself bad. What about the customer? Yeah. It's distinguished from some sort of per se rule where right, if you did right. a certain thing, that's the end of the story, like price yeah, fixing. Yeah. Okay. We didn't use the term rule of reason as such because it invokes the Sherman Act's jurisprudence, right, right. Okay. which we're trying right. to that's suggest right. you want to stay that's away the from okay. in the specific language. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Sam Miller. I practiced antitrust law for 40 years in San, primarily in San Francisco. Uh, in the mid-1990s, I was recruited by the head of the Federal Antitrust Division to be the lead counsel in the first monopolization case against Microsoft, and I became a special trial counsel in the Department of Justice to do that case, which ended with a consent decree changing Microsoft's licensing practices. Uh, I've also taught antitrust at both UC Hastings, now UC College of the Law, San Francisco, and Berkeley uh, over the last 15 or 20 years. So I'm gonna be very brief in what I have to add, but I wanted you to know a couple things. First, the Cartwright Act, and this is the problem and a gap, has been interpreted by the California Supreme Court and other courts. Next slide, please. Not, uh, not to uh, prohibit single firm conduct. In other words, there's no analog to section two of the Sherman Act in the Cartwright Act as currently interpreted. Uh, and many people have criticized this and even the assembly committee which authorized this study by the commission of the antitrust law called California an outlier in this regard because many states do have an anti-monopoly provision in their state antitrust law or some prohibition against single firm conduct. Those states include New Jersey, Maine, uh, Illinois, Texas, uh, Oklahoma, Colorado. So th there are many many states that have an anti-monopoly uh, prohibition in their state law, but we don't as interpreted today, um, including some prohibition against the kind of single firm conduct that we have described and we propose in our pages 14 to 17 or 18 in our report would then fill a gap and it would be consistent with the goals of the Cartwright Act when it was passed in 1907, 
uh, and the California Supreme Court has said that the goals are to pr promote competition, to protect consumers, and to maximize effective deterrence against antitrust violations. So filling that gap would be consistent with the current goals. The California Supreme Court has also made clear that the state law can be stricter or, uh, than federal law for two reasons. One, the California Supreme Court has said that the California antitrust law is broader in scope and deeper in reach than the federal antitrust law. And the US Supreme Court has noted in a case actually uh, challenging unsuccessfully California's legal change to allow indirect purchasers to sue. That is the ultimate consumer can bring a case under California law where only the direct purchaser can sue under federal law. But the US Supreme Court said that was okay because Congress intended the federal antitrust laws to supplement, not to displace state antitrust remedies. So if you adopted the language that we're suggesting, I believe that that would not raise any kind of pre preemption problem. Further, the California Supreme Court has said that in applying the rule of reason, and that these kind of claims would be subject to a rule of reason analysis, that trial courts can adopt flexible approaches, uh, including imposing presumptions and devising rules regarding burdens of proof to apply the rule of reason. And courts in California have experience applying the rule of reason in Cartwright Act cases challenging the conduct of two or more people like in a cartel. In fact, there is even a judicial council jury instruction, a model jury instruction in California law on applying the rule of reason. So uh, I would say just that uh, going forward, California can be a leader you mentioned the New York law. The New York law has been introduced four times and has not been passed. And I did look, uh, other states have, there, there have been uh, it, uh, efforts to introduce the New York type law condemning abuse of dominance uh, in a several other states. To my knowledge, they have not been passed in any of them. And um, the, legislative uh, resolution to uh, have you look at the antitrust law also mentioned Calera, the um, statute that was introduced by uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar, uh, which would have changed dramatically the standards of liability under the federal law. That has not passed, but uh, the section that I think Carl or uh, Aaron referred to uh, section F uh, in our proposal does uh, derive from Calera. That was one of the specific statutes that uh, the legislature asked you to take a look at. So with that, I'll conclude my remarks. So I'm gonna close, we'll take a few more minutes. I just wanna wrap up our group's presentation so we can then turn to your questions. So if we go to the next slide, please. So um, we really think California can be a leader here. Um, as we said, the Sherman Act, we think is outdated, not working well, and we can do better. We didn't start off with the plan to send you sample statutory language, um, but uh, we were encouraged in that direction um, to really uh, put these ideas into effect that were in our earlier versions of our report. So we, we think it's a very well honed and crafted language based on, again, on a lot of experience, practical experience. Um, but, uh, and we'd love it for you to kind of endorse that and pass that on, I guess, but, but it's, um, 
you know, the idea is to kind of start with the Sherman Act and do better and build on that. And there, there are other ways to do that. Um, what we've avoided, and this relates to some of these questions like Commissioner King you asked about New York, I think there's a big difference. There are some proposals out there that focus on whether the powerful firm has harmed its competitors and maybe driven them out of business. That's a factor, but we it's very important to focus on harm to customers or trading partners because you can have harm to competitors through glorious com pro-competitive conduct, such as being really good, making an innovative product. And so that, that can't be the right test. The courts, the US courts kind of went astray a little bit that in that direction, some in the 60s, they fixed it. Um, and so we wouldn't want to go back to make that mistake again. And, and, and some of the proposals do that. Um, so we, we think ours is, we're, we're not surprised that we're seeing comments that are criticizing us both for not going far enough or for going too far and somehow stifling businesses or innovation. Uh, we're really happy to answer questions, respond to those comments. We think we've got a really good down the middle approach that doesn't fall into either of those traps that it's practical um and a number of the comments for the particularly the comments more from the, the business association side saying oh this is going to stifle innovation it's going to be really bad they're not actually we think really carefully reading what we've done which has a requirement that the trading partners be harmed and the examples in these comments the plaintiff would fail. The examples of pro competitive innovative conduct, their concern will be stifled, won't be stifled because that conduct would not be prohibited or illegal under because of the prong about are the customers gonna be hurt or not? That's just such an important thing. You might hear when you get into this debates about the consumer welfare standard and whether that's good or bad. We're not using that language, but the notion that harming your trading partners, customers, or could be workers, as we've heard as well, if we think about going that upstream rather than downstream. That's the key thing. Does the market power harm these trading parties? And, um, and firms that are innovating, California businesses, small or large, are not going to get into trouble with this type of approach if they are really doing stuff that's good for the state and good for their customers. But that's very explicitly a requirement for the plaintiff to show otherwise in order to have a, vial, a viable case. Okay, so um, let me give an example, one more example, then I'll stop. Exclusive dealing. We, we talk, I talked about that uh, dent supply case with the artificial teeth, and uh, I think Fiona mentioned it briefly too. So here's, if you're a smaller firm, firm without a dominant position, that dent supply company, they had, I think, 90%, and they used this practice across the board. So it really blockaded smaller competitors. That's the thing we want to go after. Flip it around. Suppose you, there are five different suppliers of artificial teeth. You're one of them. You have 20% of the market and you try to use this practice. You go to your lawyer and say, am I allowed to do this? They look at the statute. They say, yes, don't worry about it. Because even if you sign up a few distributors, to exclusively care, say that you want these distributors to just focus on your, your stuff. You have the really in your pocket, and when, okay, you get those. You're, you're only gonna have a small number of the distributors are gonna do that because you're only 20% of the market. It's not like everybody's gonna agree to only carry your stuff, but that means dropping everybody else's teeth. They're not gonna agree to that. So you sign up a few distributors. You have not blockaded the other four firms, the other four manufacturers from getting their teeth to the distributors, ultimately to dentists in the market. So you're not impeding the competitors. And you're also, how are you gonna really harm trading partners? Let's say dentists or their patients, ultimately the people who need the teeth. You're not gonna be able to do that because they have these other choices. So you won't run into trouble on either prong. So when you, when you check, gee, am I okay? A reasonable lawyer would say, no problem. This, you wanna try this distribution strategy, go for it. If you got 90% and you want to do it across the board, then the lawyer better well say, no, you can't do that. That's what we want. So it's able to distinguish the powerful firm that could cause trouble from a firm that's competing and using some of these similar strategies that cannot cause trouble. 
And that's exactly what we want the law to be able to do. Okay, that's it. We really welcome your questions. Any questions from commissioners? Commissioner yeah, I've, Simpson. I've got, I've got two. Um, one is, um, I didn't see anything in the language about remedies. Is there, is there, uh, is that something that the courts decide what the remedy, I mean, if they find somebody's violated it, therefore what happens? Well, normally under federal law, okay, I'm speaking as the economist or other lawyers, but I think I know the answer to this. When you have a violation, the, the prime, there are a couple aspects of remedies. One is to stop doing the bad conduct, to restore competition. If you've done something that damaged competition, we want injunctions to prevent that, to, to, to repair the damage. So that would be a remedy. And that's, imp that's implicit in everything we're talking about here would be that type of okay. restore competition remedy, plus, of course, very possibly damages in private cases for the for if there was antitrust harm to, to, a, to a party, whether it's customers or competitors. So that's implicit here that we'd have restore competition remedies and treble damages, I would think, you know, um, as well for private plaintiffs. Uh, so we just didn't propose specific language about remedies. We were just talking about the liability determination. Okay. Um, the other um, question I have is um, in your sort of preamble language, uh, you have a whereas that speaks to um, courts should bear in mind the policy of California is at this risk of under enforcement, the risk of under enforcement, antitrust law is greater than the risk of over enforcement. Um, you know, I, I think I mentioned, I spent the last decade adjudicating um, allegations of misconduct by judges. And that feels like you're asking the courts to put their thumb on the scale on one side or the other. That would be like asking the CJP to, or admonishing them that it's the policy of the state that it's better to discipline too many judges than not enough judges. Or it's the policy of the state that the people are safer if you impose a longer sentence on defendants than a shorter sentence. It, it, it feels like, um, uh, as I say, you're, you're, you're trying to have the courts put their thumb on one side of the scale when there's some maybe uncertainty about where to land. And so that. So let me anything. respond, but Sam's going to come next, probably because we don't see eye to eye on this. Um, first, I think if you took out that paragraph, it wouldn't change anything else in what we have. Okay. And I noticed some people have, have it, it's gotten people's attention. They don't like it. I don't love it myself because I'm not quite sure what it means. Okay. So, but it's, it's not critical, but Sam is prepared to defend it. Oh, right. <laughs> For just well, a minute. Here, here's what I would say. Number one, you could take it out. It's not going to change the substance of what we proposed. It was in response to uh, a judicial philosophy pushed by the Chicago School of Economics uh, and written about and talked about in federal case law that the risk of a bad court decision over, over deterrence is worse than not bringing cases where there was a monopoly problem because under the Chicago School thinking, uh, markets would self-correct over, over right. time. And if someone had a monopoly and there were no barriers to entry, then other people would come in uh, to try to compete, but there are barriers to entry. And so uh, the rule then discourage federal courts from accepting plaintiff's cases. And so that statement was put in, and I believe it is consistent already with per the pronouncements of the California Supreme Court in the Clayworth case, where I, I was a counsel to one of the, of the uh, parties in that case. So it went all the way to the California Supreme Court. And it, I think Tom Campbell distinguishes it, but I think uh, yeah. it, it basically says uh, overcompensating uh, plaintiffs 
is better than not bringing antitrust cases. So I'd say we can live without it. And it was in response to the federal rules that went the other way. Yeah, I, I just, it just, um... I, I hear what you're saying. And that's okay. why we're, we're not saying we, we're saying you could strike that and it wouldn't make any difference in our proposals. Okay, thank you. Can Other I interject questions? with a, just a thought here on that point? Uh, there is a tradition in the federal courts of thinking that, oh, a, a mistaken finding of a violation is worse than a mistaken uh, failure to find a violation. And given that background, it might be useful, even if the commission didn't like say, putting a thumb on the scale, as, as one of you said, if the uh, if new statutory language said something in the nature of, in, in applying this statute, the court should not presume that uh, uh, mistaken uh, findings of liability are any worse or worse than mistaken failures to find a liability. Well, but that that sort of presumes that the court's going to know whether they're making a mistake or not. I mean, it's it's that that's what kind of bothers me about it. That well, if you're you know if you're if you're not sure what to do, then then you know lean toward over enforcement rather than under enforcement, and that. Uh, well, the, way, the, way, the way it comes sorry. up in practice is often you're not sure about what's going to happen. You have like, even take the Microsoft case, like they, okay, they did this thing, they excluded the internet, the, the, the Netscape's browser. We're not sure what effect that will have on operating systems. It's hard to say. So then you have this meaningful risk language, like there's a risk of a harm. So I think what is operationally important is, and the, the is that if it's a meaningful risk, maybe a meaningful risk could be 30%. Doesn't have to be over 50%. We might still think that's enough of a risk that we want to stop that conduct. So it's not so much putting the thumb on the scale as what, how strong does the evidence need to be of the risk that we'll consider a violation when we're not sure about the effects. Anything else from commissioners? Okay, hey, let's uh, thank you again for your time. Let's do a quick flip to the next panel. <clears throat> sure, we do have a, a few um, special speakers that are going to be commenting. And it might actually be easier if you don't mind to come up to the microphone on the floor because I think some of the panelists, most of the comments are responsive to, to your report and, and they may have some comments. So first up, um, Kristen, um, can you bring up Marshall Steinbaum and Shaberhar Kaushi? Sorry if I mispronounced your name. They should both be available via Zoom. <laughs> Ten minutes. Ten minutes each. Yeah, I'm, I'm on a time. You can cut them off. Okay. Kristen, do we have the both people up now? Okay, thank, thank you. And, and just as a, a reminder, you have a total of 10 minutes. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Marshall Steinbaum, and I'm an assistant professor of economics at the University of Utah. Uh, my research concerns the exercise of market power in online and offline labor markets, including by powerful platform intermediaries and dominant franchisors who control their workers and other disempowered subordinates coordinating economic production to their own benefit while disclaiming responsibility and offloading costs to economic agents less able to carry them. Uh, these business models, for which David Weil coined the phrase efficient workplace, heavily rely on vertical restraints, i.e. control exercise le across legal firm boundaries that would once have been the subject of antitrust liability. But since the 1970s, antitrust has retreated from its suspicion of vertical control, reinterpreting domination by powerful actors as economically efficient and therefore immune from law and policy. 
the idea that the autonomy of independent economic agents was something the law should protect was deemed uneconomic and backward looking, inviting the economy's most powerful actors to accumulate even more profit and power to themselves. The single firm conduct report was therefore in some ways uh, extremely refreshing because it recognizes the competitive threat of vertical control and seeks to beef up California's antitrust and fair competition laws accordingly. The report itself disclaims a market power test or the necessity of a plaintiff to show market power to establish liability for vertical control, although the author's presentation today seems to walk back their own report in favor of a market power market share test that continues to place all the emphasis in litigation on market definition, since they said exclusive dealing would be illegal with a 90% market share, but not with a 20% market share. I remain concerned that the proposed changes in the report do not go far enough because they continue to focus solely on the potential for excluding rivals at the same level of the supply chain as the putative violator, while not recognizing the disempowered counterparties themselves as agents whose autonomy the law should protect. That autonomy is indeed necessary to preserve horizontal competition at the same level as the dominant firm, but that is not the sole justification for targeting single firm conduct. Moreover, inviting rebuttals to findings of anti-competitive effects from single firm conduct along the lines of this conduct actually benefits consumers even if it harms competitors threatens to sneak the old pro-vertical control consensus in through the back door since such rebuttals would likely consist of our business depends on this conduct and courts have historically proven credulous to that logic. Perhaps it would be helpful for me to give uh, an example. I've studied competition in the rideshare industry extensively, particularly in California, where the dominant platform succeeded in classifying rideshare drivers as independent contractors through Prop 22, pending the current review by the Supreme Court. And the implication of rideshare driver independence is that they ought to be able to contract freely with alternative platforms and use resell, retail price setting to steer uh, customers to platforms offering better terms. But the rideshare companies do not permit this. They, they control retail prices directly, and they use de facto exclusivity provisions as well as algorithmic wage discrimination to tie drivers to a single platform. Um, which permits that platform to charge high take rates, suppresses driver pay, excludes competition at the platform level, and raises prices for consumers. In a world where drivers are independent contractors, all of this is the proper subject of potential antitrust and unfair competition liability for single firm conduct. But I fear the parameters of the single firm conduct report are too narrow in bringing such liability to bear because the desideratum would be exclusion of rival platforms rather than harm to drivers. For example, the platforms practice resale price maintenance, not traditional most favored nations clauses, at least to my knowledge. The former has the same economic effect as the latter, i.e. artificially raising the price of putatively third-party transactions, but resale price maintenance and rideshare formally does not pertain to retail prices set by rival rideshare platforms, hence would likely be immunized under the changes proposed in the single firm conduct report. And the rideshare companies can offer plenty of justification for conduct that harms drivers that a court might believe, preserving a business model that exploits ambiguity at the boundary of labor and competition law because it exploits uh, ambiguity about the boundary of the firm. The result would be, again, pending legal review that rideshare drivers are deprived of the protections of both labor and antitrust law. In conclusion, I urge the commission to consider a wider array of constituents than the single firm conduct report imagines. Workers, small businesses, independent contractors, and a range of other economic actors seeking to earn a living free of the control and domination of the most powerful firms in the economy. My name is Shahari Arkowski, and I'm the executive director of the Warehouse Worker Resource Center. We're a nonprofit organization based in Ontario and San Bernardino County in Southern California. We work across the Southern California area, focused on raising standards among the 250,000 plus warehouse workers in our region. In this, in our region. You just heard the case of a single firm conduct in the case of rideshare operators. This conduct is con common in technology broadly, um, the technology industry, and an area where there are key examples that may not be as well developed, but represent a threat to monopolization um, that we should be aware of in designing process uh, policy to count. In particular, the case of Amazon, the dominant market, market actor in several fronts, an uh, increasing number of fronts, represents a key side of concern for us. In the past decade, Amazon has become the largest private employer in the state of California and in the warehousing sector of our nation. Over 80,000 people work at Amazon warehouses in the Inland Empire region of California and many more as drivers. This creates a labor market dynamic that affects the entire region with several forces. They've grown rapidly, most dramatically in the COVID period 2020 to 22, when Amazon essentially doubled its size in the region and across the country. In, in specific, in use of misclassification, 
in particular, the establishment of subcontracted delivery service providers, or DSP, um, that provide the bulk delivery services for Amazon and those gray vans that we see all of our, in all of our neighborhoods. This creates a dynamic where these DSPs are forced to contract exclusively with Amazon for a slice of work at any local delivery station at rates and scales of production of delivery that are set by Amazon with no space for negotiation. In particular, these rates make it difficult for DSPs to employ workers at decent wages, often leads to drivers having to work off the clock, loading or, loading or waiting for the DSP to fulfill their orders at or under the cost that Amazon set. The phenomenon exists in the warehouses themselves as well. Because Amazon does not have money to have to make money on warehousing, it doesn't have to, um, Amazon is able to subsidize the development of automation and other technologies like surveillance in warehouses that increase their productivity through vast amounts of venture capital as well as profits from a huge Amazon Web Services division and other divisions that are unrelated to the um, Amazon Web Services being the you know biggest web server, approximately a third of the internet is covered by Amazon Web Services, contracts with private companies like Netflix and Zoom and public contracts with government agencies from the NLRB to the Department of Defense to the Israeli Defense Force. This market force allows Amazon to keep its facilities moving fast with significant technology support, which is good for the company's bottom line, but it's not good for the human beings who live in the Inland Empire. In particular, the warehouses have sometimes up to 180% turnover every year with thousands of our residents moving through these facilities. The turnover rate is so high because Amazon pushes its workers to move fast. So fast they have to keep up or they'll lose their, their jobs. So fast the injury rate at these facilities is double that of non-Amazon sites. In some of these sites, up to 18 serious injuries per 100 workers per year, um, burning through thousands of our neighbors every year, leading to long-term injuries and disability. The warehousing and goods movement sector is famously cutthroat and low profit dependent on contracts set by major real retailers that have massive market power and the ability to push supplier and service costs down through market power. Um, so it used to be called the Walmart effect and might now be called the Walmart and Amazon effect. The bulk of Amazon product is moved by Amazon itself and its warehouses act in direct competition with other warehouse companies. Warehouse and distribution um, companies bid to move goods for Amazon. But in turn, in the last year, Amazon has, become a, uh, has made an effort to take on freight of other retailers essentially becoming a third-party logistics company in itself. This expansion allows Amazon to affect the rest of the, go rest of the goods movement sector even more through its force as a retail market actor, and now through its reverse, its entry as a third-party part logistics um, actor. The way this plays out in our region is that the other two-thirds of the warehouse sector is incentivized to lower their costs, lower their working, their stand working standards, adopt high paces of work, high turnover employment models and other structures that Amazon has perfected, sometimes even purchasing those models off the shelf from Amazon, um, usually without the advantage of the high tech and other physical cap 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 capital that Amazon has because of Amazon's access as a tech company to venture capital and revenue from other business lines. This horizontal integration has allowed, moved Amazon from having zero employees in California in 2011 to being our largest private employer now one that has a massive effect on the working class of our state and shows no sign of slowing down its growth. Thank you. Okay, there's no audio back in the room. Uh, thank you, speakers. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, I will be brief. Uh, we appreciate the work of the two uh, working groups, particularly the uh, competi competi concentration work group, which chronicled the, unmistakably the increase in concentration in the in the in recent history. Um, we are here today to bring you a specific perspective on that. First, the question of monopolization and concentration in labor markets and the problem of, of uh, 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 labor monopsony. Second, to, disc to give you a perspective on, on that process that is specific to 
organized labor. Because in fact, as you will sh hear shortly, you have organized labor presents collective bargaining, a much more transparent process, and an ability to really uh, uh, examine the directly the competitive effects. And so uh, I, I will uh, turn that over to uh, Finn, who will uh, describe that history. And then if you will indulge me, I'd like to have a, a very brief close to tie, the, tie that to the legal standards at issue. Thank you. This is Kathy Finn. Good afternoon. I'm Kathy Finn, president of UFCW Local 770, representing 30,000 workers in the retail grocery, retail drug, food processing, healthcare, and cannabis industries in Southern California. Thank you for allowing me to present some of my experiences with respect to the impact of mergers on grocery workers. I enjoyed listening to the experts this morning as they confirmed my personal experiences about how mergers in the grocery industry have decreased the ability of grocery workers to negotiate fair wages and benefits. I'm also going to address the real human impacts of anti-competitive mergers. I've been negotiating collective bargaining agreements in the grocery industry in Southern California for over 25 years. The union's power in these negotiations has changed dramatically over those years, um, mostly due to mergers and acquisitions that have left us with just two national chains that we bargain with today. Kroger, which owns both Ralph's and Food for Less chains, and Albertsons, which owns the Albertson stores as well as Vons and Pavilions. When I began my career with Local 770 in the 90s, there were six fairly large unionized employers in Southern California, Ralph's, Vons, Albertsons, Stater Brothers, Lucky's, which was then owned by American Stores and then later bought by Albertsons, and Hughes, which was later acquired by Ralph's. And there were also a number of smaller chains that were unionized. When there were more companies operating in Southern California, the unions had more leverage and were able to secure fair deals when we went into negotiations. In those days, grocery workers were able to buy a home and send their kids to college without massive debt. In fact, it was hard to get a job in, in a grocery store because they paid well and provided excellent benefits. In fact, you, you generally had to know somebody to get a grocery store job. Obviously, housing and college tuition have gotten more expensive for everyone, but today our members can barely rent an apartment or put food on their tables. Our members were able to achieve those wages and benefits previously because competition between employers gave us more leverage in bargaining than we have today. We were able to pressure one company by threatening to strike just that one company and because each company was smaller than they are now, they didn't want to risk losing customers to their competition, and this gave the union the leverage to achieve better wages and benefits. Once we secured a fair deal from one company, the union could get the rest of the industry to agree to that same deal by threatening to strike each company that wouldn't agree um, to those terms. Due, due to mergers and acquisitions, by 2003, there were only three large national chains, Ralph's, Vons, and Albertsons, left in Southern California, and one large regional chain, Stater Brothers. The three national chains joined together in bargaining in 2003 and entered into a strike lockout pact under which they agreed that if any one company was struck, the others would immediately lock out their workers, and they additionally entered into a profit sharing agreement to ensure that none of them would be disadvantaged by a strike. They then proposed extreme cuts to wages and benefits, leading to the largest and longest strike ever in the grocery industry. Ultimately, the unions were forced to accept a contract that substantially changed the pay and benefit structure for the worse for grocery workers in Southern California. Most of the smaller regional chains had been purchased by larger chains or had closed by that time. And those that remained signed what, what we call Me Too agreements, meaning they agreed to be bound by whatever agreement the unions were able to negotiate with the major chains. Then in 2014, Albertsons acquired bonds. And since then we have bargained with just two large national chains in Southern California, Ralph's and Albertsons. And there are still a few smaller regional chains. In the negotiations since that acquisition, we have worked to engage our members in the community in bargaining to gain some leverage. And we have worked to break apart Ralph's and Albertsons to regain some of the leverage we've lost due to mergers. 
As an example, in 2019, Ralphs and Albertsons negotiated against the unions jointly. Those negotiations were very difficult and drawn out. Eventually, the unions decided to boycott and handbill every Ralph store for a period of several weeks, and we informed their customers that a strike would be coming. We then told Albertsons that we would be shifting our boycott activities to their stores if we didn't get a deal within the next several days. The pressure of this threat moved Albertsons to secretly meet with the unions separately from Ralph's, and ultimately we reached a deal with Albertsons that we could recommend to our members. Once we had that deal with Albertsons, we were able to pressure Ralph's to accept the same deal. Um, after the weeks of boycotts that we had already done against Ralph's, they didn't want to risk a strike that would allow us to send their customers to shop at Albertsons stores. Um, a similar thing happened in 2022 when we were able to reach a deal with Albertsons and force Ralph's to accept those same terms. So while we don't have the leverage or bargaining power that we had when we had six or more companies to deal with, we are still able to play Ralph's and Albertsons off against each other to some degree. That would not be possible if there were only one large national chain to deal with. Um, I also want to address uh, one example of the real human consequences of the increasing concentration in the grocery industry. As I mentioned earlier, in 2014, Albertsons announced that it was going to merge with Safeway. Safeway had already bought bonds and pavilions some years earlier. In Southern California, there were many communities where bonds and Albertsons stores overlapped. In fact, in some communities, like in Carpinteria, there were only two traditional grocery stores, one bonds and one Albertsons. In order to get approval for this anti-competitive merger, Albertsons agreed to divest 85 stores in Southern California and found what seemed like a perfect buyer for those stores, a small chain called Hagen. At that time, Hagen operated about 18 stores in the Pacific Northwest. They had a good relationship with the unions they dealt with there, and they had recently been purchased by Comvest, a private equity company that had the resources and made a commitment to invest to ensure this new chain's success. Hagen and Albertsons assured the workers that they would continue to follow the collective bargaining agreement, that they would respect their seniority, their vacation, their sick leave, accruals, and all of their benefits, and that they would provide these workers a great place to work. Most of the workers in the divested stores believed these promises and voluntarily agreed to give up their seniority with Albertsons and Bonds to stay in their home store and work for Hagen. When the stores were transferred to Hagen, Comvest, the private equity company, created two separate companies, an Opco to operate the stores and a Propco that owned the properties. Once the properties were transferred to the man property management company, Comvest leased them back to Hagen under terms that made it more difficult for Hagen to make a profit. Hagen was unprepared to operate a grocery chain of this size. And additionally, Albertson sabotaged the stores they sold to Hagen. They held onto the customer data and sent those customers coupons to get them to continue shopping at Albertson's at a different location rather than shop with Hagen. Less than six months after the merger, Hagen declared bankruptcy. All 85 divested stores in Southern California were closed and thousands of workers lost their jobs and their benefits. Many were folks who had worked for Albertsons or Vons for 15, 20, or 30 years. Some lost their homes and had to move in with family. Others lost their cars. Most lost whatever savings they had. Some were eventually able to get hired back with Albertsons, but often they lost their full-time status or had to work in lower paying jobs. And many had to travel considerably further to work. Most never really recovered the standard of living they had when they worked for Albertsons or Vons previously. Eventually the FTC allowed Albertsons to buy back some of the divested stores at a huge discount but many of the stores never reopened. One near where I live is still a boarded up building and many communities were left with only one place to shop. This is what increasing monopsony and monopoly power means to workers and consumers. Thank you. If I may, Mr. Chairman, members, I, I would like to simply call attention to a couple of points. First of all, 
This illustrates the unique characteristics of a of bargaining under in a collective bargaining situation to unique in, in the sense that there's a better record. There is a specific advantage that Congress has given to organized labor that the companies are finding ways to evade and, and, and trump by by mergers and that this is a this is a an ongoing and continuous threat to the to the uh, uh, to, to the benefit that Congress gave us in the National Labor Relations Act. It is also the, the Hagen debacle. The Hagen debacle is a, a, a an illustration of the of the vulnerability of the methodology used by the uh, by the, the expert witnesses who are summoned to these cases. Everybody did, uh, you know, both sides did a, an HHI analysis, and we you know modeled it off, and it was it's great. Nobody. Talked about well, wait a minute. What happens if if uh, Albertsons torpedoes the, the deal? What if they essentially kill the stores they they have have uh, sold and buy them back at fire sale prices out of bankruptcy? You know that just didn't occur to us. You know we all have we all have notions of you know human decency and good fair play. You can't count on that anymore. And that's just one example of why thinking outside the box is always you can't you can't out, out anticipate that and therefore you cannot place faith on your faith on uh highest pr pronouncements of experts thank you thank you i think we need to move on to our next um presenter um we have eric ensign on behalf of the california chamber of commerce and again you have 10 minutes thank you Good afternoon. My name is Eric Ensign. I am an antitrust lawyer with the law firm of Kroll and Mooring. I've been helping clients in antitrust litigation and providing antitrust counseling for over 20 years. I am appearing today on behalf of the California Chamber of Commerce. The Cal Chamber is a nonprofit that acts to improve the state's economic and jobs climate on a broad range of legislative, regulatory, and legal issues. We thank the Commission for allowing us to comment on the work it's performing with respect to California's antitrust laws. Um, I will be brief and I will focus on the proposal made by the single firm conduct working group, who we also thank for their work. One more minute, sir. I plan on touching on three topics today. One, the lack of a demonstrated need for revising California's antitrust laws and the lack of an analysis, economic analysis that justifies revision. Two, the real world impact the proposal will have on competition in the state. In short, the proposal fails to distinguish between what is and what is not anti-competitive, which will chill the very competition that it seeks to protect. And three, there are robust laws already in place for government and private enforcers to prosecute and deter anti-competitive single firm conduct. To start with, statutory reforms are appropriate when they, there is a demonstrated need for reform. Likewise, antitrust policy is most likely to benefit competition and consumers when it's based on sound economic analysis. But the proposal does not demonstrate a need for revising California's antitrust laws, and it provides no economic analysis of its likely impact. For example, the proposal is based on the belief that California's Cartwright Act is deficient because it does not regulate single firm conduct. Yet there's no showing that this purported deficiency has negatively impacted Californians through higher prices, inferior products, less competition, or any other measure. Likewise, the proposal does not include economic analysis of the cost of new regulation or how the proposal would impact competition in California. The commission now has two economic studies that measure the financial impact of adopting a law like the proposal, one from the Computer and Communications Industry Association and another from the Data Catalyst Institute. Both of these studies find that the costs of passing a law like this are in the billions of dollars from lost sales, disruption of online marketplaces and costs associated with uncertainty surrounding new and innovative offerings. 
The proposal does not take these types of costs into account, but we, we request that the commission do that very thing. Moving on to the real world implications of the proposal. If adopted, the proposal will stifle competition, innovation, and entry in California. And it will lead to increased litigation that will result in inconsistent rulings, making doing business in California more expensive, riskier, and less de desirable, all to the detriment of California consumers and workers. The, the proposal seeks to outlaw what is described as single firm anti-competitive exclusionary conduct. This is a new legal term that has never been interpreted by any court in the United States. The sheer novelty of the legal term by itself will, will bring great uncertainty as to where the line is between anti-competitive conduct and pro-competitive conduct. The proposal's main focus is on curbing increases in market power. But one of the hallmarks of competition is an effort to increase market share at the, at the expense of rivals, especially less efficient and less innovative rivals. Many times business, businesses uh, increase market power and undercut competitors by entering into new geographic regions, by offering an innovative product or product upgrade, or by slashing prices to attract their competitors' customers, all of which has been viewed commonly as good for consumers. But the proposal does not provide meaningful guidance on how courts should differentiate between pro-competitive pro increases in market power and anti-competitive increases in market power. Instead, the proposal rejects decades of teachings from courts and economists on how to identify dangerous increases in market power. For example, the proposal does away with the bedrock principle that single firm conduct must be evaluated within a properly defined relevant market. A relevant market is where competition exists and take place. It includes the product at issue and those that are good substitutes for that product. This means that establishing a violation under the proposal will not require an economic analysis of competing products that may chasten any increase in a firm's market power. Likewise, the definition of anti-competitive -exclu anti exclusionary conduct does not require any measure of market share, which is traditionally used to assess increases in market power. As a matter of economics, businesses with market shares below certain levels, say below 50%, are generally not expected to have the requisite power to harm consumers or rivals through unilateral conduct. Despite this, the proposal states that plaintiffs need not establish any threshold of market share or market power when prosecuting an action. This means that increases in market power by small and medium-sized businesses in otherwise competitive markets would be subject to expensive and protracted antitrust litigation. And many of the comments that we heard today uh, referred to powerful firms taking certain actions that harm rivals and, po and possibly consumers. There is nothing in the proposal that limits it to powerful companies. In addition, the proposal states that depending on the circumstances, common competitive practices could be unlawful, such as loyalty rebates, exclusive dealing arrangements, and most favored nations clauses. Yet the proposal does not define what circumstances may make these common and generally pro-competitive practices unlawful. This means that the proposal may make illegal your local coffee shop rewards program, may bar an arrangement by which a restaurant carries only one brand of soft drinks, and may outlaw an agreement between a grocery store and a produce supplier to provide groceries with the best wholesale prices, regardless of the market shares of the businesses involved or whether competition has actually been foreclosed. Finally, it's important to note that there are robust competition laws that government and private enforcers can use to reach, punish, and deter anti-competitive single firm conduct. Chief among these is section two of the Federal Sherman Act, which prohibits monopolization and attempts to monopolize. Section two jurisprudence has adjusted over decades and is still the best vehicle for plaintiffs, including state governments, to address single firm conduct. 
California Attorney General has used Section 2 in scores of lawsuits over the years to address single firm conduct. In fact, the California AG is currently litigating against some of the world's largest companies, including Google, Meta, and Apple, under Section 2 for their alleged single firm conduct. We've also seen private and government enforcers use California's um, unfair competition law to enjoin allegedly anti-competitive single firm conduct. Californians are protected from anti-competitive single firm conduct under existing laws. In conclusion, the proposal is not narrowly tailored to rein in defined anti-competitive conduct by unlawful monopolies. It is instead so broad and far reaching that it will chill and impinge legitimate competition at every level of the California economy. With that, I thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Question? Thank you. Sure. Just a quick question. Um, the uh, Cartwright Act is, is California's um, antitrust law. Is that, um, is, in, your, in your view, is that a, a, an appropriate type of structure for California to have for, for dealing with anti-competitive that's what anti-competitive act activities between two or more Correct. entities. Is that, a, is that working? Yes, the, the California Cartwright Act is limited to conduct among um, one or um, two more than one um, independent actors. So collusion, right. for example. Right. Um, that is its, and the, its sole and so focus. The conduct, the conduct or the, the, the um, purposes for which they're colluding are, are listed in state law. What if, what if it, if, if the Cartwright Act was simply amended to say a trust is a combination of capital, skill, or acts by one or more persons for the following purpose, blah, 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 and, and that, that's the only change in law. Well, I think that would be, I'd have to think about it a little bit more, but I, I don't know how you would apply that to single firm conduct. Um, and it would require new interpretation of, of all those standards. And the point that we were trying to rely on is that under federal law, jurisprudence has been building for over 100 years and it's provided defined guardrails for the most part. There's gray areas, of course. But for the most part, there's a good idea of what is pro competitive, what is anti competitive. And so I think revising the Cartwright Act to make the change that you're suggesting would probably suffer from the same, the same issue. Well, but the, as we, we've kind of learned uh, through this process, the, the California, uh, the, the Cartwright Act in California, I believe is a little more expansive on the, the kinds of activities it, it, um, uh, it, it's trying to prevent compared to the Sherman Act. So wouldn't that, why would that not be appropriate to apply those same standards and, you know, um, Limit or reduce production or increase pr price of merchandise, carry out restrictions in trade or commerce. If that, if the, if those activities were were carried out by a single uh, firm rather than two or more firms. Well, because the language is intended to apply to two independent actors. So, um, creating a trust, for example. Well, don't, don't call it a trust. Call it a something else. But but if 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 the if it was the same the same legal standards uh, and the same sort of improper actions by a single firm as opposed to two or more firms, why wouldn't that, would, would, that, would that be a problem? Well, I think it would be a problem in the sense, again, that be creating a new antitrust regime in California. Well, if you change, if you change the law at all, you're, cha you're, you're, Correct. you're doing that. So you don't, you don't want to change the law at all. Well, I think the current view is that what we have now is better than a proposal. One of the reasons why is because we have existing jurisprudence under both the Cartwright Act as well as the, the Federal Sherman Act um, about what um, what is, can be anti-competitive and what can be pro-competitive. Yeah, why wouldn't that apply to something that a single firm does as opposed to two or more firms, be, be anti-competitive activities? Because many times when, when a firm acts unilaterally, um, again, I'm speaking about the, the Federal Sherman Act, um, is not violating the law, whereas if it did the same thing um, collusively with a competitor, it could be violating the law. So just setting prices, for example. Setting prices unilaterally is, is lawful under all antitrust regimes. But when two or more combine to do that, 
um, that can become unlawful. And that's what the Cartwright Act is aimed at. It's aimed at combinations like that, as opposed to single uh, firm conduct that we've been discussing today. Okay, thank you. So, so next up we have Professor Tom Campbell. And I know he promised he wouldn't take all 10 minutes, but you do have 10 minutes. <laughs> Thanks for the hand. I want to start by saying thank you to everyone. I also want to start by saying this, this is a top flight committee commission working group that you pulled together. I'm speaking specifically of the single firm because that's where I was focusing. Not saying anything negative against anybody else, but these are top of the line, antitrust and law and economics experts you brought together in this working group. I have the highest admiration for them. Uh, the recommendation came from the legislature that you wanna take a look maybe at emulating New York or Senator Klobuchar's bill. Uh, the working group comes forward and says, don't emulate New York. I totally agree. And that's all I intend to say on it, unless there was something to, 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 to justify New York. One of the, maybe I'll say one extra thing. New York says abuse of a market dominant position. It's a very vague concept. Uh, admittedly, uh, you can put content into it, but it's not going to be an improvement uh, over our current law. It's going to, I think, be very, very vague. Uh, on the federal side, though, could you follow Senator Klobuchar's bill? Senator Klobuchar's bill establishes a, a presumption uh, after, if you're at 50 percent uh, and then sets a set of rules that you cannot engage in if you're at 50 percent. Notice, therefore, she needs a market definition. That bill needs a market definition because how else would you know the 50%? And it, it underlines the real importance of keeping market definition in, in, in the, in the uh, antitrust laws of California. Now, there are many points of the working group with which I agree, and I'm gonna note a couple, uh, but let me just point out one where I might suggest that they not so, they not give the possibility of abandoning market definition. Market definition, um, recently, for instance, the Federal Trade Commission has just brought an action against Capri and Tapestry, uh, accessible luxury handbags. I'm not making it up, that's, that's what they said. There's six brands that are merging and this is, being, this is being stopped. Just to make the definition of market tells you immensely about that case. And in particular, they also focused on the employees. They said that, that retail employees selling these six handbags would not have the opportunity to, uh, to get good, good wages presumably because they couldn't sell Burberry or Louis Vuitton who were not part of the mergers. Point being, the market definition should stay, please. Second, the commission, the working group very wisely suggests that we stick to economic factors. Now that doesn't mean you ignore the competitors, ignore the suppliers, ignore labor, ignore uh, the, the, the market, but it wisely suggests that you not go, California not go into the world of other factors such as opposing a merger uh, for environmental purposes or uh, income inequality, uh, factors which are important to all of us, but which as the commission point, as the working group pointed out, and, and as Michael Katz and James Farrell uh, pointed out, can better be directed can better be solved by the legislature directly with legislation dealing with environment or income, uh, income tax redistribution. Uh, the question about putting your thumb on the scale, I, 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 I just applaud Commissioner Simpson. This is, you're absolutely right. And it appears as though we don't have to spend too much more time on, on, that, on that question. Just uh, put that off. Um, Indeed, to say, if you have to err, err on the side is a horrible thing to tell a court. If you have to make an error, go ahead and make an error. Uh, no, no, do your best not to make the error. To conclude, if you go the route of Senator Klobuchar's bill in part, adopt the test that, that was so, uh, in, in, so persuasively argued by the working group today. I do not have a quarrel with, with, the, with that phrasing of that working group, uh, the way he had it up on the, on the slide, the two prongs. That's a great way to go. But please don't go to the list of offensive conduct. Uh, that, that runs the risk of triggering an analysis that truncates the 
rule of reason, which is essentially what we should be adopting. For example, predatory pricing. I agree with the working group that the present federal rule on predatory pricing is wrong. And I appreciate the citation. <laughs> and I, uh, uh, but the way, the way to approach it is to say, when a firm has market power requiring a market definition to ascertain whether it has market power, is its effort to undercut competition tend to drive that competitor out. Do the rule of reason. You don't need to bring out the specific practice of setting your price below any level of cost. Indeed, that's where our criticism agrees, that the federal approach, which was it's going to be condemned if it's below one measure of cost, cost average variable cost, uh, is wrong. You should just look at the conduct and say, does it improve the conditions for the counterparties or the consumers, as opposed to having a test about average variable cost. And the other was most favored nations. Here, I've had a slight disagreement with the working group. Most favored nations clauses are of two kinds. If a competitor says, if, 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 if a firm says, uh, if you customer get a better offer from a competitor, we'll match it. It sounds good to the consumer, but the danger is that the competitor may never make the offer. I get that. But on the other hand, a most favored nations clause where you say to a supplier, if you are being beaten up by one of my competitors into getting a lower price because that competitor's got market power, then give it to us. That's pro-competitive. So please don't include the list of presumptive or suggested wrongdoing. Stick with that fundamental test, which is the rule of reason. And I thank you for inviting me and for the courtesy your staff has shown me. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I have just one question. It might be slightly impertinent, but um, in a polarized environment with deeply polarized in interest groups, how does the rule of reason work? Whose reason are we adopting? Those who will uh, set up shell companies in order to throw a thousand grocery workers out of work for the impertinence of wanting to bargain? I mean, is that reasonable or not under uh, your conception of rule of reason? The rule of reason would fundamentally ask, are the consumers better off by more output or lower prices? And in the context of the labor market, the consumers are the employers. And so you would adjust that by saying, are the suppliers and the uh, consumers better off. Uh, so the rule of reason tries to balance the benefits with the anti-competitive harm and the, the common denominator, the single common denominator is, do you have more output, better quality, lower prices, or in the case of a labor market, higher wages, better working conditions. So it's there and it's been used that, that way by well, close to a hundred years now. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the commissioners? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, we would like to give um, our experts an opportunity to briefly respond to the, the comments we just heard. And um, if our concentration in California um, group has any comments, if you could just step up to the podium for efficiency. Thank you. And how much time are we allotting for this final section? Let's say 10 minutes. Does that work for you all? Total. For both. Total. For, for both everything. Time. Yes. Thank you. So, so let us go first here then since we're sitting up there. So thanks for the comments. Um, I'm going to respond, have, use up some of our time and then I'll see which of my colleagues wants to respond as well. Um, so first in response to Professor Campbell, my colleague and friend, um, on the list of conduct, so I believe you're referring to the list that is uh, in page 15, loyalty rebates, exclusive dealing provisions. Just to be clear, it says provides certain, these are modes of single firm conduct, I'm reading from a report, which can be anti-competitive depending on the circumstances. So it's not meant to be a list of this stuff is bad. It's giving a sense in say, of, of something that could be bad and sometimes contrasting it something that that's much less likely to be bad so it's not a blacklist 
It's just some guidance, some indication of how to think about things. The operative language comes later. So just, you made it seem like this was a prohibited list and it's not. Okay, I, I see you're nodding. You didn't mean that, but I want to clarify for the record. Okay. Um, second, you talked about the MFNs, the Most Favored Nation Clause. I think, and maybe we can continue this privately, I think there were some of what you were talking about are, are median competition clauses, which is different than MFN clauses. So there could be some confusion there. We can follow up with the staff if you want on that small point. Regarding Mr. Ensign from the California Chamber of Commerce, who had a much more vigorous attack on our report, you might have noticed. Um, I think this was a combination of mischaracterizations and scare tactics, okay, which fit together. They work together hand in hand. The mischaracterization is because um, it's uh, not an accurate description of what we were proposing. In particular, many of the things he's talking about that supposedly our proposal would prohibit would not be prohibited. And if you read the part, particularly that Doug Melvin went through the operative language there, they either wouldn't harm customers or they wouldn't significantly, um, they would not reduce the, the competitive restraint imposed, imposed by rivals, those being the two prongs. So if you actually look at what we said and go through the logic, a lot of what he claimed is inaccurate regarding the actual proposal. So that's the mischaracterization. Then the scare tactics, let me just pick up on his specific examples. You've got a loyalty program at your Starbucks, was it anyhow? Somehow that's supposed to be threatened. How could that possibly be threatened? The loyalty program is something that customers want. So it benefits the customers right there and is not harming and is not excluding any competitors. There's other coffee shops. Well, maybe there aren't any other coffee shops. The only coffee shop in town. There's, they're not they're not blocked from coming in by the fact of the loyalty program, and if the and the customers are benefiting, so so like the notion that that's going to be uh, attacked or is is fanciful. Uh, soft drinks. Um, what was that example? Oh, oh, the, oh sorry. A, a distributor wants to just a restaurant wants to just carry Coke. Well, what's I don't how is that going to be a problem? You know, there may be some will have Coke, some will carry Pepsi, some will be non-exclusive. We see that all the time. It's not hurting the customers. The restaurants are welcoming this in exchange for a discount, presumably. And there's plenty of opportunities for other uh, soft drink suppliers to distribute. So both prongs fail. Third example, um, I can't read my writing, okay. Um, can't read the example, but, but it, it failed also. Um, <laughs> oh, well. My mother would be unhappy with me. My handwriting, my, my, is, my penmanship's poor. So, so look, vigorous attack from certain business interests, not following the report carefully and not applying it and therefore getting scare tactics. Aaron, do you want to add anything? I think we have, um, maybe we don't have much more time. Actually, you get some time too, of course. Did you want to add anything, Aaron? I'm not sure. Yeah, Uh, there were two ideas that the Chamber of Commerce put forward that were sort of tangled together. One was that we were getting rid of the absolute bedrock principle of the importance of market definition in cases of single firm conduct. And the other was that uh, there would be no analysis of substitute products um, as to the second, you're going to have lots of analysis of substitute products for both of our prongs. You have to diminish the constraints rivals are posing. Well, those are substitute products in some sense. And to do analysis of whether you've actually hurt people, you have to consider substitute products. Uh, for both the costs and the benefits, and they're going to be absolutely central. Um, market definition is not required under section one of the Sherman Act. The Supreme Court has been very clear that, well, if you have anti-competitive effects, that's enough. And by the way, it means that you have market power, elsewise you couldn't have had anti-competitive effects. And you do have to have market definition for section two because you have to prove 
to the firm's a monopoly. And we pointed out, actually, that's a bit of a problem because non-monopolies can cause anti-competitive harms. So I'll stop there. Let, let me pick up one, one minute. An example, we heard about healthcare. If you've got an area where there are two hospitals, neither might have a monopoly or three, each of them could cause a lot of trouble through single firm conduct by working with health insurers or putting rules. We've heard about that earlier. So that's properly covered and it doesn't, and having a monopoly screen would not get there. The other thing I could read my, the other example was best wholesale price. All of these, the loyalty programs, the soft drinks exclusive, the best wholesale price, there are circumstances where those things, those type of practices, each category can cause trouble. Our, now, our proposal, you would look at the market reality and you would quickly see in cases where the company was, had many competitors who were not blockaded by this and the customers weren't hurt, that, that it wouldn't go anywhere. And that's what we're trying to do, go directly to those issues rather than look at proxies that are inaccurate and a waste of time often. Two very quick comments. One, I wanted to, to agree as forcefully as I can with uh, Professor Edlin in the sense of a market definition should uh, never be either necessary or sufficient for liability under joint conduct or single firm conduct. Um, you know, if you have video of someone putting marbles in his competitor's shoes, you don't need to try to define a relevant market to figure out if the person is competing on grounds that aren't competitive. You have the evidence. You know, if you have real evidence of uh, power over price, of senior executives telling each other in the example of Microsoft famously, we, we're gonna do this and it will cut off Netscape's air supply. Look at the evidence, have a little modesty about the economic frameworks and the theories that, that, that any economist any group of economists can argue over, uh, you know, until the end of time. Um, uh, not to denigrate economists, but there are, you know, I, you know, for example, you could define a market as blue pens I'm holding in my hand. I have 100% market share of that. Or you could define the market as um, all writing utensils on the face of the earth, and I have, you know, essentially zero. You can do that in almost any situation. Uh, uh, Second, um, just a quick response to the wonderful remarks of um, the single firm uh, conduct group. Um, I'm worried that the competitive benefit exception will swallow the rule. That is where all litigation will focus. Every defendant will say there are competitive benefits. And so then the key is going to be how do you weigh the competitive benefits against the competitive harm and doing it in a way that doesn't you know, um, which is what ends up happening in the courts. And this is the way it's playing out right now, that if a defendant can come up with a plausible explanation for why they did something, they get off. Um, you know, for example, Apple, to make it concrete, um, there was a case on the verge of trial, or did go to trial in the Northern District of California, it was about the iTunes system. Um, the iTunes system was rigged in a way to disadvantage competitors. And the jury instruction under current law was if there is any reason other than impairing competition that Apple used or that Apple uh, was motivated by, then that's the end of the story and Apple cannot be liable. Um, that's the way it's playing out in the courts right now. So once you open the door to that kind of uh, defense, which you need to, we have to be very, very careful about providing courts with clear instructions about how to balance that in such a way that doesn't um, excuse or immunize large categories of anti-competitive behavior. We now have uh, some commenters on Zoom, don't we? We do have some commenters in Zoom, but if there are any folks in the room who would like to make public comment, if you could step forward to the podium first and keep your remarks brief, um, state your name and who organization you are with. And um, in the meantime, we will be setting up our Zoom folks. If you want to comment, by Zoom, please indicate so by raising your hand. Thank you. So um, thank, thank you, commissioners. My name is Anthony Wright. I'm the executive director of Health Access California, the statewide healthcare consumer advocacy coalition. Um, we want to here to thank the Citizens Law Review Commission for this effort to an update antitrust law and specifically to support this effort to include single firm conduct broadly 
um, in the, in these protections and to you know basically broaden the effort to deal with anti-competitive behavior in our markets as as much uh, and to do so as proactively as possible. Um, obviously, my expertise is not in antitrust, but it is in healthcare and healthcare prices. And as was stated earlier, the example of healthcare could be exhibit A on the issue of uh, the impacts of and the harms of consolidation and anti-competitive practices to consumers, to patients, and to payers. Um, we've been uh, working on this issue for many, many years. Um, healthcare is rife with market failures, and we've worked on some of the ones that were mentioned today, pay for delay, uh, issues of very high hospital costs. And you know, in fact, the seminal paper in the healthcare literature, the title is, It's the Price is Stupid, um, because there is just a recognition that in healthcare, what we pay for healthcare is much less less related to the cost of that care, the quality of that care, the outcomes of that care, the, e the equity measures, and it's actually more about what is the relative market power of, of any of the given players uh, with re with regard to it. And so right now we have an incentive structure where the incentive is not to get is to get bigger rather than to get better. Um, the it was stated in the presentation earlier that I want to underline that the prices for either just Northern or Southern California are, are, are fairly different, dramatically different. And the main driver is consolidation and um, inpatient rates as vary as much as 70% because of that. You can see that if you go to the Covered California website and compare the, the premiums between them, you can see that in uh, a, a range of other things. And so I think this, this work is incredibly important to, to move forward on that. Uh, and so this needs, as has been stated, both an aggressive focus while the monopolization is taking place by uh, sometimes the single firm contact, whether by acquisition or otherwise. Um, uh, the academic literature suggests that prices go up by 20 to 40% after a merger for hospitals, 10 to 20% for physicians. Um, and in light of this, Health Access has done, uh, and other consumer groups have done a lot of different work at the Attorney General's office uh, working to, and the Attorney General's office had also had to create their own healthcare unit on this subject. I do want to cite just the two examples that were mentioned, Sutter and um, Cedar sinai Huntington Beach. Um, I wanted, the, the Sutter settlement was a landmark, but I want to just indicate how hard that was. That was, uh, went through two or three different AGs in terms of having to, to take that from, from now to its implementation. Um, it did include some language, not just the fine, but undertakings to uh, prevent anti-competitive contracting practices by Sutter going forward. And that, and that is something that there has been legislation to try to make those undertakings, things against prohibitions against all or nothing contracting or things like that and make that industry-wide. Uh, there, there was legislation last year, AB 1091 by Assembly Member Wood to look at that. That bill also would have expanded the AG's authority to look at um, hospital and health industry mergers. And that's the reason I wanted to cite the Cedar sinai Huntington Beach example as well, which was a good example of something that the AG can do to prevent um, pr a price increase so allowing the merger to go forward, but, but had doing something ameliorative to, to prevent a spike in prices. But the only reason that the attorney general had that authority was actually not through antitrust law. It was through the attorney general's review of nonprofit assets. And, and he actually only has that authority for nonprofit, hospitals, for, for nonprofit hospital mergers. But if those were medical groups or for-profit hospitals, he would not have had that same authority. So that's, that gives an example of why we need to update our laws to, med, uh, to try to update what, what is needed in terms of dealing with this. Dr. Wood does have a live bill this year that just passed Assembly uh, Health and Judiciary this year, uh, AB 20, 3129, that focuses on the impact of private equity and taking over healthcare uh, industry parts. So I, I, I'll just simply say that I think that this, the healthcare shows the reason why we do need to update these, these laws. Um, particularly in the healthcare context through tools like the new Office of Healthcare Affordability, but it also shows that there needs to be a broader look at this and that would be a benefit. The more that you can deal with healthcare costs, that would be a pro-competitive effect for all these industries because high healthcare costs are having an anti-competitive effect on every single industry um, in terms of how we uh, pay for healthcare right now. 
Thank you very much. Good afternoon, commissioners and staff. My name is Robert Singleton and I serve as Director of Policy and Public Affairs for the U.S. West Region at Chamber of Progress. We are a tech industry association supporting public policies to build a more inclusive country in which all people benefit from technological leaps. Our corporate partners include companies like Amazon and Google, but our partners do not have a vote or veto over our positions. Really quickly, I will just first state that I am not an attorney um, and not an expert on antitrust law. Um, so we originally were gonna have someone with a lot more experience come and present to you at a certain point. We'll be submitting some more long form correspondence to, uh, to address some things, but really quickly uh, here today, I wanted to share with you some of our concerns in regards to the legislative proposal that was included in the working group on single firm conduct. Um, while we appreciate the volume of analysis and work that went into producing the report, we respectfully disagree with the proposed legislative approach. Specifically, while we agree with the report's conclusions that the New York bill's reliance on an abusive dominance position would be out of character with California's economy, we believe the legislative proposal is analogous to implementing an abusive dominance standard by another name and is thus equally out of character with the innovation economy. In particular, uh, proposed changes would hinder the world's best online marketplaces. Uh, furthermore, we oppose applying any duty to deal uh, standard to online platforms. So in reviewing the working group's substantive report, we'd like to rebut some of the assumptions made. Firstly, the comparison to public utilities and other traditional monopolies is not apt um, to the modern economy. Competition is non-existent in many of these central services, thus rationalizing utility-style regulation of so-called natural monopolies. This is out of step with the dynamic and highly competitive landscape of online platforms. As an example, the rapid rise of TikTok as older services like Vine have withered showcase fleeting, the fleeting nature of success in this hyper-competitive sector. Additionally, we urge you to consider the distinct nature of, both, of supply in both cases. While utilities maintain your absolute control over their supply, no one product, service, or marketplace has been able to monopolize human attention, especially when having to sell ads against the attention in a two or even three-sided marketplace. One of the larger points we'd like to highlight is how different the European versus American standards are with regard to competition policy. Uh, for instance, as the working group report states explicitly, there's no easy way for the courts to weigh the anti-competitive harms against the pro-competitive benefits, which form the basis of the U.S.'s uniquely pro-consumer policy posture. California should not protect competitors at the expense of consumer welfare and assessing single firm conduct. By not accounting for these benefits, the EU's DMA-style regulations have limited consumer access to valuable and ubiquitous beneficial products like Google Map Links, for instance. What also makes online marketplaces unique in any exploration of single firm conduct is how curating such marketplaces enhances consumer welfare to a degree that may exceed our ability to measure. For example, if we incorrectly conclude that iOS App Store has monopsonized the market for apps on iOS devices and thus impose a duty to deal or must carry obligation on iOS devices, we open the floodgates to the worst of the internet. The bottom line is that not every app should be allowed on a curated, privately owned, managed marketplace. For instance, after attempting uh, the insurrection on January 6, 2021, both Apple and Google removed the messaging app Parler from their private app stores, citing poor moderation policies and negligent design. So it was not allowing a directly implicated hate speech app onto an otherwise highly robust and comprehensively curated marketplace an act of anti-competitive behavior. Would a duty to deal not obligate them to carry this odious content? Lastly, we'd like to highlight how inappropriate it would be to consider upstream labor impacts and future standards addressing single firm conduct in California. Businesses of the Golden State care deeply about user experience and keeping consumer prices low. This invariably leads to decisions that affect broad parts of the international economy and the international supply chain generally. How these decisions may or may not impact California, just California workers would be exceedingly hard to access and the results imperfect. California has more robust labor standards than the United States generally, and certainly greater standards than many other countries that participate in the supply chain. But as the fifth largest economy in the world, we cannot properly account for every decision made by every other company outside of the core criteria of consumer benefits. So thus contemplating the expansion of this standard to include all indiscernible downstream labor impacts is unwarranted and imprudent for this body. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the California Revision Commission hearing. 
My name is Angela Harris, and I'm the founder of Wellness of Life. I am the business owner of an East Sacramento location. I've been established there for 18 years. I've been in holistic health and wellness for 31 years, serving in the community. I have had my J Street location for, like I mentioned, over 20 years, and the brand has been serving the community for an established amount of time. I have been working incredibly hard to build this brand. And because of that, what I do know is that I cannot speak about the antitrust laws. However, what I do know is it impacts my business. And because of that, based on Google and Amazon being a powerhouse, I can tell you how these policies will affect me as a minority business owner. And so therefore, based on what happens within a person doing a Google search based on my Google profile, you can search my business online and we have a five-star review. And then also, we also have Google voicemail and also an online store that also gives you map instructions to our business location, also to provide instructions and information in order to accommodate an individual to be able to assess convenience. And then most importantly, we also are able to have convenience for the consumer. Because of this, you know, Google provides a completely resource, complimentary for my business that provides us to be definitely feasible during inflation. When people search for my business in my neighborhood, the East Sacramento location, Wellness of Life organically comes up and based on the search and my profile, they are able to learn everything they need to know about my business. Once again, convenience based on the consumer search. And because of this, my brand of business is critically important to the customer establishing the connection and most importantly, retaining new customers and also being established to retain and to have the retention in my customers that truly exist. This is critical once again, and most importantly, reviewing my information on Google also helps me to be sustainable and maintain my business. I know Google is a powerhouse and most people believe that it's too profound and too powerful. However, when Google uses its power to help small business owners like myself, in order to energize the existence of small business, it helps to aid the American dream. As I am a minority, actually double minority, as I'm female and I'm a woman of color, it helps to fuel this feasible time during inflation. So therefore during COVID, it also helps us to sustain and maintain our business based on certain types of aspects that are complementary that Google has provided in order for us to be cost effective. If your self-preferencing proposals breaks Google Maps and Google Business profile in California, as it also has done in Europe, then you will be breaking the local business as mine and other business owners. And then it also affects our bottom line. So therefore, I just yield you to thinking whole picture and being a part of our breakthrough rather than our breaking point. What affects Google hurts small business. Small business represents over 90% of businesses in California and also over 7.5 million employees. So it's just not myself, it's other local business owners, as well as the staff that we also contribute to based on the workforce. In self-preferencing, Google Maps and Google Search is good for small business. And what your concern and objective is in reference to Google is self-preferencing. When it comes to those two convenient services, my question to you is what is the objective in order to look at things whole picture to be able to not only to support small business, but also the American dream of small business owners that also is a part of the workforce. Thank you for your time and thank you for your service. I'm open to any questions, if you have any. Thank you. Um, hello, and thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Andy Lamb. I've uh, been a Californian all my life, uh, born and raised here. I uh, spent the last 20 years in the greater Sacramento area. I grew up in Salinas, California, in Monterey County. I own a small marketing consulting business, and my office is generally a local coffee shop. Um, 
And it's really the convenience and it's the accessibility of things like services provided by Google, uh, where I can easily look up reviews for coffee shops um, that, that are near me. When I was sitting back there, I looked up coffee shops in Roseville and one of the ones that got five stars near me is one of my favorites. I left them a review to help them be more successful. Um, but the ability to get knowledge of a coffee shop that's in walking distance from me to get driving directions or to easily identify the hours of operation uh, is invaluable. My wife, uh, who's a school teacher, uh, we appreciate the fact that we can just quickly look up and find local restaurants with pricing informa information that fits our budget, along with options for takeout um, during our busy weeknights because she's usually grading. Um, I don't know exactly what the anti self preference tool will do with big tech, um, and I'm not as concerned about that. But if you're trying to help consumers like me or small business owners like me to get fair value from digital platforms and get good information that makes our lives easier, then breaking up Google business profiles will not accomplish that goal. My concerns are around three different costs. The first cost is the convenience to the consumer. The second cost is to the tools that are made available by um, companies like Google at low or no cost. And the third is um, taxes in a state that is upside down already. Who's gonna pay for it that way? Thank you for your time.